Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Heard It Through the Grapevine, Oral Philosophy in Africa. Philosophy seems to be found primarily in books. It has its own section in the library and in any good bookstore, and when you turn up for the first session of any philosophy class, you're handed a list of the texts you'll be reading throughout the semester. Yet some philosophers have had their doubts about writing as a vehicle for philosophical reflection. No less a philosopher, indeed, than Plato. Of course, he did write books, but only in dialogue form, which strongly suggests that for him, philosophy had its proper home in conversation. That suggestion is strengthened by Plato's comments on writing itself. One of the letters ascribed to him disavows the composition of philosophical treatises, on the grounds that, as he says, this knowledge is not something that can be put into words, but is born in the soul, only after long-continued intercourse between teacher and pupil. This epistle is of disputed authenticity, but there is also the definitely authentic Platonic dialogue called the Phaedrus. It contains a passage relevant in multiple ways to this series on Africana philosophy, in which Socrates tells the story of how writing was invented by the Egyptian god named Toth. When this innovation is put before the king of Egypt, the king rejects it on the grounds that whoever uses writing will become weaker at remembering. You provide your students with the appearance of wisdom, says the king, not with its reality. Your invention will enable them to hear many things without being properly taught. Classical historians take this passage as symptomatic of the transition from an oral culture to a culture that was increasingly centered around the written word. Think of the epic poems ascribed to Homer, which apparently emerged from a long tradition of recitation before being written down. The same sort of transition happened in other civilizations like India, where the ancient Vedas and Upanishads first existed orally rather than in books. Even in the modern day, academic philosophers are surprisingly conflicted about the writing of philosophy. True, it's become pretty well impossible to get a permanent job in philosophy at any university without publishing your ideas in writing but nearly all philosophers will wax enthusiastic about the importance of classroom discussion, the give and take between teacher and student that Plato already highlighted. This mode of instruction is still called the Socratic method, in honor of Plato's portrayal of his own teacher. All of which has an important implication for the study of Africana philosophy. If we were to assume that any philosophy worthy of the name must be written down, then we could probably wrap up our consideration of pre-colonial philosophy in Africa right now, having covered the textual traditions of ancient Egypt, Ethiopia, and Islam in Africa. But suppose we take seriously the idea that philosophy can exist without a tradition of writing. In that case, we will be open to the idea that philosophy may be found in all of the indigenous cultures of the African continent. These include many cultures that, right up into the 20th century, transmitted their traditions of wisdom in oral form, just like the ancient Greeks and Indians. Thus, Africana philosophy offers an ideal occasion for testing the notion that philosophy can exist without writing. Intriguing as it may be, this idea runs up against an immediate practical obstacle, namely the stubborn refusal of time machines to exist. Genuinely pre-colonial indigenous cultures are largely inaccessible to the present-day historian of philosophy. Mind you, we shouldn't dismiss the importance, first of all, of archaeological evidence. You'll recall that we made use of it in talking about the emergence of abstract thought in prehistoric Africa on the basis of cave paintings and other evidence. But for the most part, the search for philosophy among the indigenous peoples of Africa has been linked not so much to archaeology, but more to anthropology and ethnography, whether we are talking about the work of non-African scholars who have visited Africa, or perhaps even more importantly, the auto-ethnographic work of African scholars reflecting on their own cultures. In lieu of a time machine, scholars have drawn on their own memories or on the information they could gather from those most closely in touch with old traditions, in order to obtain data of philosophical relevance. Of course, present-day African communities could never be pristine and untouched replicas of what existed in pre-colonial times, given the impact of colonialism, 
and even the very presence of anthropologists that colonialism notably facilitated. Then too, there is the present dominance of Christianity and Islam. As we have explored in recent episodes, many traditional systems of belief in West Africa and elsewhere had already been partly displaced in the centuries before European colonialism by the spread of Islam. Still, Christianity and Islam in many ways reshaped, rather than completely erasing, older African traditions of thought. The living traditions of present-day communities, accessible through the reports of members of those communities and the work of anthropologists, thus remain interesting sources of philosophical material. In making use of that material, we are, ironically, reading written texts after all, texts that inform us about ideas that have been passed down orally in cultures that mostly, or entirely, lacked their own traditions of writing. This enterprise is sometimes called ethno-philosophy, an apt term insofar as it indicates that we are dealing here with an intersection of two fields of research, ethnography and philosophy. Ethno-philosophy is far from an uncontroversial field. The term ethno-philosophy itself first gained prominence through its usage by a philosopher from Benin named Pauline Hudonji, who intended it to be a criticism of, as he derisively defined it, ethnological work with philosophical pretensions. Many have argued that the whole enterprise is itself colonialist or beset by fatal methodological and conceptual flaws. Ultimately, we're going to let you make up your own mind about that, but to help you do so, we are going to introduce the idea of ethnophilosophy in this episode, and then, in episodes to come, touch on some of the particular themes that have been explored in this sort of research, including the nature of time, human personhood, God and other divinities, ideas about causation, and communitarian ethics. At a minimum, you'll be learning a lot about the practices and beliefs of a wide range of indigenous African peoples. More ambitiously, you might even be convinced that whole cultures, rather than only texts written by individual thinkers, can indeed be the bearers of philosophical doctrines, teachings, and concepts. Obviously, we'll be tackling the topic only with regard to the communities of Africa, but just as obviously, the questions and problems we'll be exploring would also arise with other still-living cultures that look back to oral tradition, like indigenous peoples of the Americas and Oceania. At stake here is, in fact, nothing less than the question whether philosophers should be interested in all cultures of the world or only in traditions of writing that can be traced ultimately to ancient Greece, India, and China. Ethnophilosophy is usually reckoned to have a founding text of its own, in the shape of a book written by a Belgian missionary named Placide Templis. Born in 1906, he spent about 10 years working with the Luba people of the Congo. His initial motivation was to further the cause of Christian conversion and to understand how this process might be going wrong. As he lived among the Luba, he became increasingly convinced that missionaries and other Westerners were approaching their task in a simplistic and counterproductive fashion. Rather than seeing themselves as teachers of wholly innocent and passive natives, the Westerners should come to grips with the indigenous beliefs, indeed the philosophy, of the Africans they encountered. This idea lay at the heart of his 1945 book, Bantu philosophy, which was originally written in Dutch, but then also swiftly translated into the other major Belgian language, French. Temples describes his own project by saying, Before we set about teaching these Africans our system of philosophical thought, let us try to master theirs. The humility of this mission statement is balanced by the audacity of Temples' account of Bantu philosophy. For him, the Bantu worldview centers on the concept of force, or life force. It provides a key for understanding everything from their political arrangements to certain practices that other Westerners called magic. Thus, the chief of a clan has his standing not simply because of family inheritance, but because the force of the community and his ancestors has been gathered in his person, which in turn gives him the power to strengthen other forces, both human and natural. Humans in general have greater force than animals, plants, and minerals. What looks like magic is in fact the human's investing of part of his vital influence in other non-human objects. Behind these cultural phenomena, Temples discerned a full-blown metaphysical theory, which he contrasted to Western philosophical assumptions. Whereas the Westerner thinks of all being as static, static, 
with individual substances and their properties making up the furniture of the world, for Africans, being is dynamic, because to be is to possess a certain kind and degree of force. Temples would presumably be pleased, or simply bemused, to learn that decades later, analytic philosophers would be putting forth a not dissimilar idea under the banner of an ontology of powers. This theory takes dispositional causal powers, or perhaps we could even use Temples' term forces, to be the fundamental building blocks of metaphysical reality. Color, for instance, would be a power for giving rise to a certain visual experience. It must be said that Temples' talk of vital force is less articulate and detailed than what you'd find in such contemporary philosophical discussions. Measured against that standard, the theory he ascribed to the Bantu is rather obscure. What exactly, we want to know, does it mean to conceive of being dynamically and as a force? How would the obvious objections to this way of thinking be answered from the Bantu perspective? Many of his critics, however, were not upset by the vagueness of the theory so much as by the very nature of the project. We can start with the fact that his book, for all its self-conscious openness to African people and their ideas, was written by a non-African with an openly pro-colonialist agenda. He addresses the book to all who wish to civilize, educate, and raise the Bantu, and thus to all colonizers with goodwill, most particularly missionaries. Then too, we might raise questions not only about the metaphysical theory of force, but also Temples' grounds for ascribing that theory to the Bantu. A major source of evidence in the book is traditional sayings. He claims at one point that the vital force metaphysics is expressed in standard greetings like, you are strong, or you have life in you. This may sound persuasive, but one could equally imagine a Bantu visitor to Europe, concluding that the natives there think that sunshine has moral properties, because Englishmen say good day, the French bonjour, and the Germans guten tag. Of course, Temples' insights rested on a decade of living amongst the people he was studying. As he himself claimed, one attains the ability to think like the Bantu and to look upon life as they do. And he would have vigorously denied foisting his own ideas on the people he studied. Thus, when talking about the Bantu understanding of the human person, he instructed his reader, We must make a clean sweep of our own psychological concepts and prepare ourselves to finish with a conception of man very different from that which we now accept. The best thing that we can do is to listen and to analyze what the Bantu say on the subject. Well and good. But even if we concede that there are genuine Bantu ideas and not just Temples' ideas in this book on Bantu philosophy, it remains the case that the articulation of the conception of vital force in this book is his, and not one produced by the Bantu themselves. Temples insisted that he was describing a philosophy implicitly understood by all members of the community. He called it wisdom and even ontological knowledge but he did not claim that any member of the Luba community would be able to convey that wisdom in words, as Tevels himself was able to do. To the contrary, he wrote, We do not claim, of course, that the Bantu are capable of formulating a philosophical treatise, complete with an adequate vocabulary. It is our job to proceed to such systematic development. It is we who will be able to tell them, in precise terms, what their inmost concept of being is. In spite of condescending moments like this, Temples attracted favorable notice from many African readers. His project was positively received, for example, by Alexis Kagame, whose 1956 work, called the Rwandan Bantu Philosophy of Being, displayed Temples' influence. Kagame extracted implicit philosophical ideas from widespread cultural features, but with the twist that he focused on aspects of African languages, working especially with his mother tongue, Kinyarwanda, as a key example of a Bantu language. He pointed to the use of the same root behind the words umuntu, ikuntu, and ahantu, referring respectively to intelligent beings, unintelligent beings, and the space-time framework within which those beings exist. An implication of Kagame's approach, much debated in subsequent work on Africana philosophy, is that thinking like a Bantu and talking like a Bantu go together. More generally, we can study the language of any people to discern the underlying philosophical ideas of that people.
A further conclusion could be that it is impossible to understand a given system of thought without mastering the language that goes with it. Does this mean that African philosophy, if it is to remain genuinely African, must be practiced in African languages and not in global languages like French or English? This is a question worth asking, even if we are, after all, talking about a continent whose languages number in the thousands. This potential implication of Kagame's work, that each distinct group in Africa might be expected to have its own local philosophy, would push against a tendency detectable in temples and much other ethno-philosophy. This is the tendency to generalize from findings about one, perhaps very small, group of African people studied by an ethnographer, to larger groups or even all Africans. The point was made well by an early critic of temples, the Ugandan philosopher and poet Okot Pabitek. In a damning three-page review of Bantu philosophy published in the early 1960s, Pabitek complained that Temples was drawing inferences from his experiences with the Luba to all of the Bantu without having bothered to go see what other Bantu groups, like the Zulus, might think about all this force business. As Pabitek put it, can serious African scholars concerned with a correct appraisal and analysis of African beliefs and philosophies afford this kind of cheap generalization? We'll see this problem arising again when we move on to look at more specific topics that have been addressed with the tools of ethno-philosophy. As a warning against cheap generalization, we'll frequently be pointing out the diversity of cultural practices and beliefs across the continent. In his review, Pubitek also complained, predictably and justifiably, about some of Temples' own language, for instance, his constant reference to the Bantu as primitive. And he fastened onto the point we made just a moment ago that the act of rendering the supposed Bantu philosophy explicit was a task for temples and not the Bantu themselves. In a longer passage, criticizing this aspect of the book and setting out a preferred method, Pubitek wrote, is it not strange that not even a single Bantu elder should be able to give a rough description of Bantu philosophy? It is, to say the least, unhelpful pride to start off by holding that a people do not know what they believe, or cannot express it, and that it is the student who, after discovering it, will tell them what this belief is. It is the student who is the ignorant person. It is he who learns from a people, and he learns only a small part of their philosophy. The role of the student of traditional philosophy, it seems to me, is as it were to photograph as much of and in as great detail as possible the traditional way of life, and then to make comments. Here, Pabitek is simply insisting on a point Temples had made himself, but arguably not taken seriously enough. The student of African culture and philosophy is just that, a student, and not someone preparing himself to be a teacher for people who in the last analysis remain primitive. With this, Pabitek was offering insights that have been embraced in anthropology quite generally. Rather than seeing the people who are being investigated as something like rats in a biologist's laboratory or substances studied by a chemist, the investigators must realize that they will interact with the people they visit, that their presence will have an impact, and that they themselves may be profoundly changed through their encounters with a foreign culture. As Hontunji put it, ethno-philosophy, as exemplified by temples, appears to treat the black man as a topic, a voiceless face under private investigation, an object to be defined, and not the subject of a possible discourse. Anthropology is inevitably a two-way street, so to speak. This incidentally goes well with the insight that African cultures, as they could be encountered by visitors in the 1930s or now in the 21st century, are themselves not static, not mere repositories of ancient cultural notions. A trip to rural Africa is no time machine. Rather, as we've already noted, these cultures show signs of their own engagement with other peoples and religions, and they have changed to grapple with modernity, not least with colonialism and its after-effects. As you can see, the study of oral traditions in Africa faces numerous conceptual challenges, which go well beyond the rather mundane and practical difficulty of lacking textual materials. But any philosopher worth their salt will perk up at the mention of conceptual challenges rather than losing interest. They are a big part of what makes ethno-philosophy worth exploring in the first place.
We'll be kicking off our tour of specific topics within ethnophilosophy in a couple of episodes when we turn to another famous representative of this approach, John Mbiti. We'll be considering his bold attempt to articulate a distinctively African philosophical conception of time, and seeing how that attempt provoked worries along the lines we've just been sketching. But to make sure you're equipped for the intellectual journey to come, we want to have a closer look at one of the figures discussed already in this episode, Okot Pbitek. He was not only an early critic of ethnophilosophy, but a poet and playwright, and a philosopher who argued for the distinctiveness and irreplaceable value of oral culture. Appropriately enough, we'll be covering him by way of a conversation with Samuel Imbo, a leading expert on Pepitek's thought, here on The History of Africana Philosophy. (laughs) 